decided to launch a national campaign in his own back garden, raising more money and achieving more in his 100th year than perhaps any centenarian in our history. He knew instinctively which organisation he wanted to thank and support. It was and is the NHS. And he was right, because there are many people and groups responsible for the UK's vaccination programme, and we owe our thanks to our brilliant scientists, to Kate Bingham and the Vaccine Task Force, which has procured over 400 million doses, seven different types of vaccine, the manufacturers, uh, the delivery drivers, the pharmacists, the military medics, countless volunteers. But to get this life-saving medicine into the arms of the nation at the kind of speed that we're seeing, we're relying on the doctors and the nurses and all the staff of our NHS. And it's thanks to their effort, the most colossal in the history of our National Health Service, that we have today passed the milestone of 10 million vaccinations in the United Kingdom, including almost 90% of those aged 75 and over in England, and every eligible person in a care home. And with every jab and every day, we have more evidence about the effectiveness of these vaccines. New research from Oxford University suggests the protection provided by the first dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine kicks in after three weeks and lasts right the way through to the booster at three months. And research also shows that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine seems likely to reduce transmission to others. Even if these vaccines cannot make us invulnerable, and no vaccine has ever given 100% protection to everybody, the evidence increasingly shows that our vaccines achieve this crucial objective to reduce death and serious illness from those major strains of COVID that have been subject to research. And in the days leading up to our review point in the week of the 15th of February, we will be accumulating even more data, helped by NHS Test and Trace, so that we can begin to chart a way ahead. Starting, if the date allows, with the reopening of schools on March the 8th. And I'll be setting out as much as we can about that roadmap forward on February the 22nd. And though today there are some signs of hope, uh, the numbers of COVID patients in hospital are beginning to fall for the first time since the onset of this new wave, the level of infection is still alarmingly high. And I'm sorry to say that we've lost another 1,322 lives in the last 24 hours alone, and our hearts again go out to every family uh, that grieves. And the wards of our NHS are under huge pressure, with more than 32,000 COVID patients still in hospital. And so tonight, let's clap together for Captain Tom at 6 p.m. And let's clap for the spirit of optimism uh, that he stood for. But let's also clap for all those he campaigned for, our brilliant NHS staff and care workers. And let's do everything we can to carry on supporting them. Because if we stay at home, protect our NHS and save lives, then, in the words of Captain Tom, tomorrow will be a good day. I'm now going to ask Chris to go through the slides. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, so the first slide uh, shows the number of people coming forward and testing positive for COVID uh, in the UK. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the numbers are now going down steadily. Uh, and these, this is backed up by other studies looking at this in a different way. So there is now a continual steady decline thanks to the work of everyone uh, across the entire country uh, in avoiding unnecessary contact and staying at home uh, except where there are necessary things for them to do. Next slide, please. As a result of that, the number of people in hospital with COVID has now gone down from its peak uh, quite uh, noticeably but as the Prime Minister said, there are still a very large number of people in hospital uh, and more people uh, than there were in the first peak in April last year. So this is still a very major problem, but it is one that is heading the right way. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, it is good to see that uh, as a result of that, and this is always a bit later, uh, 
uh, in time, lagged in time, uh, the number of uh, deaths in people who have COVID is beginning to come down. But as the Prime Minister said, the numbers are still extremely high. And they will stay high for uh, quite some time, but coming down, uh, on, uh, as you can see, on this pathway. And the, f the first effects we will see of, vac of vaccination are likely to be on these uh, death numbers. Next slide, please. The good news about vaccination is, as the Prime Minister says, this is steadily increasing uh, in all four nations of the United Kingdom, and particularly here in England. Uh, uh, we have very clear data showing it going up uh, day on day, and the numbers are now very substantial. Next slide, please. So the final slide, and I wanted to take a little bit of time on this slide, uh, shows two things. It shows in the very dark blue bars in the centre uh, the people who have sadly died from COVID, uh, and uh, in the wider bars, these are everybody who's uh, come into hospital. And this is from a hospital study done here in the NHS system. And uh, what you can see with this is that if you look at the red line, the top red line, this is every age group from zero to four right at the bottom to 90 and over, including uh, Colonel Sir Tom's or Captain Sir Tom's uh, uh, age uh, at the top. And if you look at the first red line, that is the group of people down to the age of 70, including people in care homes, who are liable to uh, go into hospital because they're older if they catch COVID. Uh, and uh, although uh, the majority still will come out of hospital or survive, a significant uh, number of those will die. Uh, and if you take it down to 70, uh, if you imagine that the, ho the vaccine was completely effective, which, as the Prime Minister says, you wouldn't expect for any vaccine, but completely effective, that is 83% of all the people who have died of COVID uh, in this wave uh, are over that age group. So they're over the age which we will get to when we vaccinated everyone over 70. But if you look at uh, the situation for people who've gone into hospital, only 54% of all the people who go into hospital are, are over that age. So what this means is once we vaccinated down to, uh, the, to uh, 70 and above, uh, plus those who care for them, frontline NHS and frontline care workers, uh, we should significantly reduce the number of deaths, but we will reduce by a much smaller number the number of people going into hospital, because a very large number of people going to hospital who will come out of hospital, they will, they will recover, uh, but they have to be in the NHS and have care, for example, oxygen and uh, dexamethasone and steroid uh, drugs. So if we then vaccinate all the way down to what's called the JCVI, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, uh, first wave, this is down to people over 50, uh, and those uh, who have actually got uh, pre-existing health conditions, you then get through virtually all the people who um, have a high chance of dying. So this is around 98% of those who die are in that group. Uh, and importantly, uh, around 80%, just over 80% of all of those who go into hospital. So the first wave, which is uh, the aim is to complete on the 15th of February, we would expect a situation where we can stop a very high proportion of the deaths but a rather smaller proportion of the pressure on the NHS, those very large numbers in hospital. As you go on to the next wave, down to those over 50, we uh, have further inroads into reducing death and also significantly reduce the pressure on the NHS. The final point I'd like to make, and it's, an, it's a cheering one, uh, is uh, if you look down at the bottom of this, the number of children uh, under the age uh, of 18 who go into hospital is, uh, relatively speaking, very small compared to adults. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Let's go to the public. For Spencer and Hammersmith. For those people who have received vaccines, are you keeping track of the number who subsequently test positive for COVID are being admitted to hospital? And of those, how many are dying? In particular, for those who have been vaccinated but still catch COVID, are you able to tell from the data whether the severity of the illness is reduced? Thank you. Very important questions from, uh, from Spencer and really repeating the, the point that although the, there's a high degree of efficacy uh, in, in the vaccines that, that we're using, no vaccine is 100% effective for, uh, for everybody. But Chris, probably one better for you. 
Uh, thank you. It's a really important question. Uh, and yes, what we are do doing is linking up the data for those who've been vaccinated uh, with hospital admissions data, emergency admissions data, and also uh, mortality data, people who died, uh, so that we can actually see whether there is an effect uh, and how, more importantly, how big the effect is, because we're sure there will be an effect, uh, of vaccination on reducing the number of people who get severe disease and have to go to hospital and the impact on those who die. So we're making a big effort to try and link those data together so that we can give clear uh, answers to the question uh, that's implied in this, which is we can then say the vaccines have had this impact on, on uh, mortality, on reducing deaths, and have had this impact on reducing the number of people who are getting severe disease uh, and going into hospital. Thanks very much, Spencer. Paul in Eastbourne. Um, first of all, congratulations to everyone that's been involved in the vaccination programme. I think it's something we can all be proud of. Um, my question is related to the second dose. And it's really that if I've had my second dose and I'm socialising exclusively with other people that have had their second dose, can we ditch social guidelines, uh, social distancing guidelines and intermix normally? Bearing in mind that if we weren't mixing exclusively with people that have their second dose, i.e. Uh, first doses and people that have not had a vaccine at all, that we would, of course, still maintain all the social distancing measures in place. If I can't socialise exclusively when I'm exclusively with people that have had their second dose, uh, what's the rationale? Thanks. Uh, Paul, in, in another very, very good question. A lot of people are starting to ask this question. I think that we really need to see more data, of, uh, particularly about uh, transmission uh, from uh, between people who have already had the uh, the vaccine and others before we uh, we think about relaxing social uh, distancing and guidelines for uh, for everybody. And I think that uh, really this is something that we will uh, we will start to think a, a bit further down the line about what potential is opened up by uh, by these vaccinations. But I think what everybody wants to see is a world in which we can relax uh, the guidelines and the uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions for everybody. So relax all the kind of uh, restrictions for everybody and, and do that by vaccinating, uh, as, as Chris was explaining with the uh, the chart of the most vulnerable groups, va vaccinating as many of the most vulnerable as, as we can as fast as possible, and then taking a view about the interaction between that and the, the prevalence of the, of the disease. At the moment, uh, as, as, as we've discussed several times, the level of infection is still forbiddingly high for us to imagine uh, the relaxation of the, uh, of the current guidelines, but we're obviously going to be reviewing that uh, in the days ahead. Chris, anything you want to, uh, to say more about this, this idea that people increasingly talk, uh, talk of, uh, of you know, vaccine uh, passports, as it were? So thank you, uh, PM. I, I mean, and thank you for the question, because I'd really like to make uh, two points really uh, clearly at the beginning and then expand on them a bit. The first is, if you've just been vaccinated, there is a period of time after that when you do not have any protection. So it's very important that in that stage, you realize that it takes uh, two or three weeks in older people, probably slightly longer, uh, to achieve any uh, kind of protection. Second thing is, we are, our, our really clear advice at the moment is, please stick to the social distancing, irrespective of whether you've had vaccination. And of course, because we are delaying the second dose, the great majority of people are actually vaccinated uh, with one dose, but not with two at this stage. But, but that will change over time as, the, uh, as we start to do roll out the second vaccination. But then I think the thing to understand with these, and this is in, in, in answer to the question, what's the rationale? Vaccines are going to protect in three different ways. The first of which is they will protect you, the person who's being vaccinated, and they'll protect to a very good degree uh, based on the data we have so far. Of course, we need to get more data in real life. That's what the last question was about, but we are confident it'll protect you as an individual. Secondly, as you say, it'll mean that, we will, that people will be able to know that many of the people they interact with have also been vaccinated, and that will also reduce the risk, although we don't yet know uh, with confidence quite how much these vaccines reduce the risk of transmission. So they do reduce the risk of severe disease, of symptomatic disease and of dying. They probably reduce the risk of transmission and data came out today to support that, but we're not absolutely confident about exactly uh, how much. And then the third way they produce, uh, reduce the risk is to reduce the amount of the virus that is circulating in the whole population. And that we are nowhere near uh, being close to. And I think if you think of those numbers right at the beginning and think back to the last published um, 
ONS data that implied somewhere like one in 55 people currently have the virus. The rate of virus in the community is incredibly high. So that third thing we also need to do, which is use the vaccine plus the social distancing that everyone is doing to pull the rates of the, uh, of the virus right down. And then if you've got very low rates in the community, you're vaccinated and your friends and colleagues are vaccinated, that will substantially reduce the, the risk for everybody. Thanks very much, Paul. Laura Koonsberg, BBC. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. And the vaccine programme is a huge source of pride to so many people. But can you give a firm date for when hotel quarantine will start? And will you offer more help for people who just can't afford to isolate? As you well know, not everybody is entitled to the £500 payment that is available in some circumstances. And if not, aren't you leaving two big holes in our defences? As one of your own MPs said, the heating's on, but the window is wide open. And Professor Whitty, with some of the measures improving, in your view, might there be a case for opening schools in England to all pupils again before the 8th of March, which is what Wales and Scotland look to be set to be doing? Laura, a couple of points. We have um, among the toughest uh, border uh, regimes now uh, anywhere in the world. And so um, the, uh, we're restricting as much as we can any risk of importing uh, new infection into this, into this country without totally secluding the UK economy, which relies on 75% uh, of its uh, medicines come from Europe, 50%, 45% of, uh, of our food uh, comes from, uh, from overseas, uh, 250,000 businesses uh, rely on, on imports. So we can't cut ourselves off uh, completely. Uh, but what we can do uh, is say it's illegal to go on holiday, uh, which it is. It's illegal to, to go on holiday. It's illegal to uh, come to this country from a great list of, uh, of countries ar around the world. And uh, if you do come here, uh, then uh, you will be, uh, if you do come here from one of those countries, then you will be, uh, as we've said, taken uh, and put in uh, special uh, accommodation. Uh, and the uh, Health Secretary will be making a further announcement about that uh, tomorrow, Laura. But you know, even if you're not coming from there and you're coming into this country, even if you're a UK uh, national returning to this country, uh, just think what you've got to do. You've got to uh, take a test uh, 72 hours before flying. Uh, you've got to uh, do a, a passenger locator form. You can be kicked off the flight if that doesn't happen, uh, and so on. And then you've got to quarantine, uh, and you'll have the isolation assurance service uh, on your case uh, for, for 10 days. So uh, we, are, we are operating a, a very tough uh, regime already and uh, you know, within the limits of what is uh, possible given that we're a, uh, a, a, an economy that depends on, on trade and access to the, to the world. Um, and uh, your, your second point was about uh, uh, test and trace and isolate. And uh, again, uh, yes, we do want to see more people uh, isolating and, uh, and, and doing the right thing, but overwhelmingly uh, people are and, uh, and have been. Uh, don't forget that in addition to the £500, there's a £10,000 uh, fine uh, if you don't. In addition to all the other support that, we, uh, that we've offered uh, throughout the pandemic to help people uh, throughout the, uh, the pandemic. And NHS Test and Trace is now reaching, I think has a capacity of 800,000 a day. Uh, it's absolutely colossal. And if you listen to uh, the, some of the, the uh, points that, uh, that uh, Chris and, and I were making earlier on about what we've discovered about the, uh, the effectiveness of the, of the vaccines, the transmissibility of, of the, of the uh, virus uh, of, of, with the, the vaccines, that is because of uh, NHS tests and trace and and uh, the vast capacity this country now has for genomic sequencing. So uh, the short answer is, uh, yes, I do think people should, uh, uh, should self-isolate, but NHS Test and Trace is reaching 90% uh, of contacts and, uh, and uh, the vast majority of them are doing the right thing. Um, in answer to the question you asked me, I mean, the narrow question about dates is, is always going to be a matter for ministers. Uh, but I, I, let me be a bit more helpful than that. There are very clearly two sides to this argument, uh, and both of them are true. There's an incredibly strong set of evidence, which I don't think anyone disputes, that being in school is good for children, it's good for their mental health, it's good for their long-term health. Uh, it obviously helps their parents as well. That's not the primary thing, but it's also a very important part of it. So there are really clear medical 
and educational and societal reasons why being in schools is absolutely the right place to be. Uh, and we are confident, and this actually goes back to the fan chart I showed, that the risk to children relative to adults is incredibly low. Uh, so we consider school is a safe place for children to be as well as the right place for children to be. None of that is disputed by anybody. On the other side, and this is also not disputed actually, is that uh, we, have had, you know, we were managing to hold the line with schools open before we got the new variant uh, in England, uh, B1171, with this new variant, which is more transmissible, and I think the evidence for that is really clear now, uh, we had to unfortunately do some additional things, which included the closure of schools, to pull down the incredibly high rates of uh, increase we had up to this very high rate we've now currently got at the moment. Now, the rates are now coming down, but they're still incredibly high. And if we were to start to take off again from the very high levels we are at the moment, the NHS would get back into trouble extraordinarily fast. So it's essential that people carry on social distancing as they are, but some of these additional measures, like schools, are also very important. Now, the point where, in a sense, those two balance, where we think we'll feel confident enough that the line can be held with the schools open... Uh, to make sure that those first set of things, that the benefits to children are there, is, is a difficult judgment, and that's one which fundamentally is one for ministers. But those two sets of arguments I don't think are disputed by anybody, and it's really just a matter of when is exactly the right moment to balance them. Thanks very much, Laura. Carl Dinn, ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Given what we've just heard, I think I ought to ask you the schools question then. I mean, the vaccination programme is going so well. We've had so much good news today. Are you absolutely committed to not reopening schools in England before the 8th of March? Or, or do you think you could pull that forward if things are, are really going well? And if, for example, you managed to vaccinate those first, first four groups uh, more quickly than originally expected. And if I could also ask uh, Chris Whitty one on uh, the, the death rates. Uh, I think you said that we will first see the effects of the vaccination program in the death rates. Those are already coming down. Is it possible that we are already seeing the effects of the vaccination program in that death rate? Carl, let me give you the logic of, of the March the 8th uh, date for the earliest, which we think it's sensible to, to open schools. And obviously, I'm very, very hopeful that we will be able uh, to do that. Uh, but let me, say, let me say why we think that's the, the prudent uh, date to, to set. Um, we, we've got to make a judgment about the uh, effectiveness of the vaccines in bringing down the death, death rate and bringing down uh, serious illness. And uh, Chris will say a bit more about that at the moment, but uh, that judgment we're, we're going to make in the week of the, of the 15th. We're going to really look at all the data. We'll see some promising stuff from, uh, from Israel, uh, but at the moment, to the best of my knowledge, we're not yet seeing the kind of conclusive data that we need on that, on that key point. Uh, then uh, we want to be waiting to ensure that after uh, February the 15th, we leave uh, three weeks for all the JCVI cohorts one to four, all those most vulnerable groups that you saw uh, on uh, Chris's chart, uh, have allowed their vaccination uh, immunity to be acquired. And uh, as you know, it takes uh, about three weeks for it to, uh, properly uh, to set in. Then uh, we need, so that, that speaks to a date uh, of, uh, of, of about March the, uh, March the 8th. Then, then, of course, you need to give the schools uh, two weeks' notice uh, to, uh, to open. And so, for all those reasons, we think that's the, the sensible uh, date. And I, I just would say to people who understandably want to go faster, and I, you know, I, I share that, uh, that anxiety and that urgency, because, uh, as Chris has just said, uh, we fought for so hard and for so long to try to keep uh, schools open. I think that was a reasonable thing uh, to do. But what we don't want to do now Carl, that we're, now that we're making progress uh, with the vaccine uh, rollout and we've got a, a, a timetable uh, for the way ahead, we don't want to be forced into, uh, into reverse. And, and we, so we think this is the, the prudent and, and cautious approach. And we're going to, I think it's much better to stick to that. Uh, and in terms of the other question you answered, uh, asked me, um, I, I, although you can, if you really do multiple analyses, convince yourself there's a bit of uh, a, a change, the very earliest sides of a change, in reality, what we want to see is a significant reduction in death rate. You can actually see, which actually matters to people, significant numbers coming down. And if you look at the age ranges of people who are dying at the moment, there's no strong evidence yet, 
and nor, to be clear, would we expect it yet, for reasons I'll come on to, uh, that actually, for example, people in their 80s are suddenly reducing in terms of mortality, but people who are younger ages who are vaccinated later are not. Things are coming down, but in proportions that you would expect. Now, we expect, we in, anticipate that will change, That's, but, but the reason there's a delay if you, think, if you just think this through, and this is just building on the point the Prime Minister made, is between the time someone is vaccinated and the time you would expect to have first effects in older people who might be, for, for the sake of argument, three weeks, it takes a further week for them maybe to get infected uh, after that time, first infected, and obviously that risk continues then from then on uh, for a long period of time, and then to get more severely ill, and then in some cases, uh, although a minority of cases, to die. Uh, and that's quite a long delay. Uh, and although we've got, due to the remarkable efforts of all the people the Prime Minister is talking about, particularly the NHS in rolling out this vaccine, to very high numbers now, it is relatively recent. And the death rates we're seeing at the moment are people who would have been, in, in terms of the vaccine, you, would, you, know, you wouldn't have expected to see any effect till going back about five weeks. And the rates of vaccination were much lower at that stage. But we do hope that and anticipate that, it's not just a hope, it's an expectation, that as we go through time, in the next two or three weeks, we will start to see reductions in mortality in the people who've been vaccinated compared to those who've not. But I think the good news is the reductions in mortality in absolutely everybody, and those are happening because of everybody staying at home uh, and uh, avoiding unnecessary social contact and all the things that we know we should do, the hands, face, space actions. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Sam Coates of Sky. Prime Minister, with 10 million people vaccinated, is it morally right that it continues to be illegal for the over 70s, 80s and 90s not to see relatives who have also been vaccinated and waited their three weeks? You're saying that there's not enough data, but don't you have to balance this with the fact that for some of these people, time might be short and you've had pretty strong evidence already. Can't we apply some common sense to people like that, in particular, rather than criminalising them? And to Chris Whitty, there are some people in government who say that every adult might have had, or at least been offered a first dose by May and a second dose by the end of August. What do you think of that? And in that case, what's the rationale for social distancing measures in the winter, life not back to normal, which some of your colleagues have suggested might be the case? Well, Sam, I totally understand people's feelings of, of frustration and uh, how strongly people want to be able to see their elderly relatives. I, I would just give a very uh, simple answer. Uh, obviously, those steps have been taken uh, with care homes to make them as COVID secure as possible, to allow people uh, to be visited under very uh, controlled uh, circumstances. But we, the, you've seen the numbers in, in care homes lately, although they're not as bad as they were, perhaps in there's a proportion of the deaths as they were in the, in the first peak. They remain uh, very, very strong sad and uh, we are seeing far too many deaths of elderly people and so we've just got to remain uh, very cautious for the time being but as you can see we are we are making huge progress through those groups and we'll and we'll go on uh, in the in the in the in the weeks ahead and the the, the time uh, to uh, get everybody done uh, as you know is can be now measured in weeks and, and months so uh, uh, we will get it done as fast as we conceivably can uh, in answer to the question you asked, asked me, I mean, optimism is a great thing, uh, but logistics aren't about optimism. They're simply about what numbers you can get through uh, in the right kind of order. And I think the number that May and August strike me as at the very optimistic end. I think if you talk to people who are doing this extraordinarily fast rollout, and if you look at this globally, this is an extraordinarily fast rollout, they would say they will go absolutely hell for leather as people are doing an incredible job but those numbers trying to hit those dates that is probably beyond what is possible given the constraints of supply and all the other things that we have to deal with remember also it's very important we've got to revaccinate all the people in the first uh, uh, tiers as they go through so at a certain point and that point we had this process of delaying the first uh, so the second dose uh, largely to increase the number of people we could get through very quickly to begin with, to provide that initial the predom predominant uh, protection at the, at the beginning. But we do have to vaccinate all of them within 12 weeks, and that means that from March we'll be starting to revaccinate as well as the first vaccines, and that will uh, by, by inevitably slow things down. And on winter, um, the reason my colleagues uh, have uh, implied that a highly contagious uh, 
respiratory virus, which uh, is not going to be eradicated from the globe or indeed eliminated from the UK, may surge in winter is because that's what highly contagious respiratory viruses always do. I think everybody knows that. So it is no surprise to anybody, I think, and should not be, that even if we have a highly successful vaccine rollout, which we clearly are having, uh, and the vaccines work very well, which we uh, very much hope we'll have the solid data on very soon, there will still be residual risk. If you think of flu, uh, which actually is probably less contagious, that's why we managed to get rid of flu completely this year, uh, but with the, non, the NPI measures uh, than COVID, you still have flu surges despite lots of people being vaccinated and many, many people having had it previously. So you've just got to expect that in the winter there will be surges of respiratory virus. And I think to expect that somehow magically this will not apply to COVID seems surprising. And I don't think that will come as any surprise to anyone in the general public. Thanks very much. Jason Groves, uh, Daily Mail. Thanks, Prime Minister. Uh, we've heard a lot about the impact on mental health, and there's reports that you're looking at maybe easing the rules around outdoor exercise. Can you tell us anything about that? And also, uh, the Mail is campaigning for a statue for Captain Tom. Is that something you could back? Um, and to Professor Whitty, are we past the peak now? It looks like we are from that graph. And Lots of people will have seen the video of you being harangued in the street the other day. How did you feel about that? Do you feel in danger? Well, uh, Jason, on the on the issue of a uh, a, a statue for, for Captain Tom or uh, a, a public memorial of some kind to Captain Tom, uh, I'm absolutely, uh, of, of course, open to that. I know that everybody, uh, that's the, the kind of thing that people would want to support and uh, will be uh, working with his family to... Uh, to, to see what uh, they feel is most appropriate and, uh, and be taking that forward. So I think your, uh, your campaign is an excellent one. Uh, yes, I mean, I think that most of my colleagues think we are past the peak. Um, now, that doesn't mean you could never have another peak, but at this point in time, provided people continue to follow the guidelines, we're on the downward slope of cases of hospitalizations and of deaths uh, in all four of the nations of the United Kingdom. So I think we do think at this point, this peak at least, uh, we are past. In terms of being harangued, I mean, uh, you know, the odd young lad showing off occasionally happens. I, I didn't think anything of it, frankly. I was very surprised he was picked up by the media at all as anything of any importance. I'm sure he'll become a, a model citizen in due course and hopefully more like Captain Tom, who's the kind of person who I think much more exemplifies uh, the, the yeah, spirit yeah, of the UK. Yeah, I mean, he was yeah, himself yeah clearly absolutely remarkable, yeah, yeah. but what he was also doing was showing how it is that everybody has responded to this. And this has been a, a nationwide, everybody responding. So if it wasn't for that, we would not see those numbers coming down, and that peak you've just talked about would not have occurred. That is because everybody has worked together. Forgive me, Jason, I think you asked me something else. And I've, and, and, but remind me what it was. Well, I'll ask you quickly, there's been reports you're very concerned about- Oh, uh, outdoor exercise, yes. On, yeah, outdoor yes. exercise, yeah. Yes. Uh, I, priority is, is schools, uh, Jason, uh, but obviously we keep everything uh, under review. The, the most important thing is to, is to continue to make progress as we are in, in driving the infection rate down, and that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Francis Elliott of The Times. Um, uh, Francis, you need to unmute. Prime Minister, when might we expect uh, a date uh, for the second wave um, of vaccinations. At the moment, we only do told spring. Uh, obviously, February the 15th manages to energise the whole process. Um, and you seem to have changed your approach pre in the exiting of the lockdown. Previously, it was open where we can. Uh, now it's stay closed until we can all open. Um, yeah. it, is that fair? And, and why have you changed your approach? Is it because you're, you're worried about mixed messaging from the, from the previous regional tiers approach? And Professor Whitty, if I could ask you, it was Dino Harding said today that 20,000 people are not um, complying with the instruction to isolate. What, what do you think should be done to improve that compliance rate? Francis, we, we're going to continue to uh, keep an open mind uh, about the uh, regional uh, or, or the national approach. But, but at the moment, quite frankly, when you look at the graphs, uh, it's pretty uniform, across, and there are some variations, and some things are going in slightly different directions in some parts of the country, but it's pretty uh, uniform at the moment, and therefore it, it feels to us at the moment uh, as though um, uh, we'll, be, we'll be going down in tiers uh, nationally, and I think that, that 
but that obviously could uh, could change. You'll be you'll be hearing more on uh, on February the, the the 15th or in the week of February the 15th, and on as I say on February the 22nd, uh, we will be setting out in as much detail as we as we can about uh, where we uh, see the dates, what the timetable uh, could be, uh, the earliest dates by which we want to do what. You remember uh, what we did last year, uh, setting out a, a route map. Uh, we'll, we'll do that again, though this time uh, the, the terminus will be clearly that we'll, we'll, we'll have got everybody uh, vaccinated, and we, uh, I hope, uh, and uh, we'll be in a, a, a very different situation uh, from that which uh, we were all in last summer when we got the, the disease down, uh, which was a fantastic effort to a much, much lower level. But we, we always knew, we always knew that it had the capacity to surge back uh, in, in the autumn. Uh, and over the over the over the winter months, as, as indeed it has this time, as we go into the second half of the year, uh, we're going to have the confidence of knowing that a huge proportion of the British public, uh, and particularly the most vulnerable, uh, will have uh, been vaccinated and, and and probably received a very high degree of immunity. So that will very much change our approach to the to the autumn and the winter. Those, as, as Chris says, highly infectious respiratory diseases don't uh, go away altogether and not, not easily. Uh, in, on the question you asked, I mean, the big risk to the public is the total number of people uh, and the, the absolute number will reduce, the biggest thing we can do is actually reduce the total number of people who've got COVID now because that will reduce the number of contacts. So actually getting the rates down is the single most important thing we can do. But of those who are phoned up uh, because they're a contact, First thing is we should be very grateful to the people who first actually notified because that's a huge public service to everyone else. And then in terms of their contacts, actually very high proportions of people do self-isolate. But the reason people don't, there are broadly two. There's not realising how important it is. So they need the positive incentive to do it. And that's very important for people to realise by doing this, you are making sure you're not the bit of a chain that leads to a vulnerable person at the end. So it's a way of protecting vulnerable people is by self-isolating. People understanding that is absolutely critical to this. And then, of course, it's about trying to reduce disincentives. Uh, and uh, those have been debated at some length. But those are the two things you, which basically mean whether someone is or is not going to self-isolate. Just on the, um, on the question on the timetable for the second wave, yes. uh, when can we expect a bit of clarity around uh, beyond spring, which is a bit vague? On the second wave of, of vaccinations, I think what you, you can expect is that on the, on the 15th we'll say a bit more uh, or about uh, where we've got to, and obviously we're hopeful that we'll have done JCVI uh, 1 to 4, and, and, in, and in that week uh, I expect we'll be saying uh, a bit more about the, the timetable for doing uh, JCVI uh, 1 to 9 and, uh, and the priorities thereafter. So that, that'll be, in terms of the, the timetable for where the vaccinations are going, that's, that's what you should uh, more or less expect. But on the, on the 22nd, I hope uh, to be setting out in, in some more detail uh, is some, some dates and, and some possibilities for, uh, for the whole of the, of, of the year ahead. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, let's go to, to David Hughes of, of PA. Uh, Prime Minister, it's obviously good news that 10 million people have received their first jobs. Do you have any information yet on how many people are refusing to, uh, to take the vaccine? Uh, and if so, what impact is that going to have on your timetable for easing the lockdown? Um, Professor Whitty, um, returning to the footage that Jason raised with you, um, how alarming is it that this deep into the pandemic, there are still people who don't seem to understand the gravity of the situation? And how frustrating is that for you and your fellow medical professionals? David, I've been amazed and, th and, and so encouraged by the, the way uh, communities are, are coming together to get the, uh, the vaccine, to take it. People are taking it up across uh, the whole of the country. I was, uh, yes, it, it, we, we have been worried about vaccine hesitancy in, uh, in, in uh, some parts of the country, in, in some communities. Uh, that's unquestionably an issue, and we're, we're doing everything we can to, uh, to encourage people to come forward. Uh, to give them the, all the confidence they need, and they must have confidence. You should have confidence. It's a it's a great thing to get a vaccine. But I was I was uh, I, on I think on Monday I was up at the the Al Hikma uh, Centre in in Batley uh, talking to uh, community leaders there who've done an amazing job and got uh, I think the, the the vaccination rate for the over 80s in that part of in Yorkshire is now 97 percent, including uh, all communities. So it's a, you know it's a a, a, a real uh, achievement, and I would urge everybody to. 
follow the example of, of, uh, of Yorkshire if you're not already there. I mean, the data, and this links both to what the Prime Minister just said and the question you asked me, the data is that uh, vaccine, vaccine acceptance, understanding by the general population of the importance of vaccine, is incredibly high in the UK compared to uh, almost any other comparative country. Uh, and I think people do understand the importance. They understand how to balance the huge benefits uh, against any uh, things they're concerned about. Uh, am I alarmed about that? I mean, it's going to be a noisy uh, group of people who, who disagree with virtually anything. But actually, there is no clear evidence as a large background swell of opinion. The great majority of people uh, fully understand the issues. They've stuck extraordinarily well over an incredibly long period of time to the very difficult lockdown and other measures. And they've done that because they understand that this is the way that you protect the vulnerable in society. And that is the overwhelming majority of the population. And I think, I think it's very easy to lose that uh, sense of perspective. It is the overwhelming majority of people who uh, have done so understand it. And if you don't uh, think that this is a big issue, go and talk to a doctor or a nurse who works in a hospital and they'll put you right very fast. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, everybody. See you next time.